Well, welcome to Impact Thursday Night. My name is James Trevett of Whitestone Christian Ministries, and tonight we are going on with part four of Citizen of Heaven. Um, it was a tough decision about whether to do part three of Fireproof or part four of this, and I, uh, I or God opted for this. Uh, in the discussion of Citizen of Heaven, our key scripture is Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've discussed, not everybody is eagerly awaiting the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if we took a survey of the, of the Christians to say either come or wait, I think most of them are going to say wait. Because I don't think they understand the kingdom. And that's what we're here to understand. Now, this crowd's different. We're all say, come Lord Jesus. But if we really understood the kingdom, we'd be saying come Lord Jesus. We eagerly await a Savior from there. And our key scripture is also in John 3 that talks about how do you become a citizen of the kingdom. Well, we remember that you become a citizen of the world by being born into the world. If you're born into the United States, you become a citizen of the United States. If you're born into this, by the Spirit into the kingdom, then you become a citizen of the kingdom. So you become a citizen of the kingdom the same way as you do in the world. You have to be born into it. So you are born again. What's born of flesh is flesh, but what's born of spirit is spirit. So you end up with sort of a dual citizenship, uh, one from the world and then one from the kingdom. And there is an overlap. Otherwise, if there was no overlap, then you'd be dead. Uh, it allows you to operate in the world, but still be in the kingdom. But you can have your being, you can abide in one or the other. And the goal, I believe, that God is telling us is it's time to move into the kingdom. Uh, even though the kingdom is, is something invisible, it's still something that's, that's real. Uh, I mentioned the fact that here we are in Holly Springs with the government. And the government makes rules and laws. And we operate in Holly Springs under those rules and governments, not understanding that there's a federal government, which we may have never seen. This also got rules and laws. Well, it just so happens that the way we've been operating down here in the world, we've been making our own rules and laws independent of the kingdom laws. And some, at some point, the king is going to show up. And it's not like we didn't have the book. But still, we've decided to make our own rules and laws based upon what we believe is right rather than the true government of the kingdom, which rules over all things. So the king will return soon, and it's not going to be a bad thing. It's a good thing, and we'll discuss that. We notice that uh, one problem, though, is that the kingdom is invisible while the world is visible. But that's okay because... Uh, for many of you, you realize that retirement, for instance, is out there somewhere, and your retirement is actually invisible. It's not here yet, but yet you know to save for it and prepare for it. But so many more people are doing that than are preparing for the kingdom. And I think that's to, uh, that's to our shame as the body of Christ. We have not explained it. We have not prepared people for the return of Christ. We talked about uh, last class about the difference between the kingdom and the world. And in this case, we use Maslow's hierarchy of needs to discuss the fact that Maslow discussed the way the world operates, that first people seek their physiological needs, and then their aesthetic and social needs, and then eventually their spiritual needs. And that's the way you, you work. And as society breaks down, they move to the lowest point of seeking physiological needs. And that's the way the, king, the world does work. But the kingdom works the absolute opposite way, right? Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. So the, uh, the Lord turned Maslow upside down. Because the kingdom operates just the opposite of the way of the world. And God left us in this situation so that we must seek Him and understand Him, because the kingdom is real. If we're here in Holly Springs and we're operating under our own laws, but if we're within the federal area, those laws are real and can operate here also. So we've got to understand that the kingdom principles actually operate right here, right now. Even though our government is making rules and laws, the kingdom rules and laws are in effect and do work. And we're going to look at a little bit more of that tonight with... Uh, a new concept here I'll lay out of uh, what's new. 
And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, in what's new, notice I have uh, a couple of pictures here. One of Jesus, who's using a couple of fingers here to, uh, if you will, to uh, direct or control the flow of the power of the Spirit of God into uh, a man who's lame, that he may be healed. And then in the other picture, we have a girl who's using two fingers to control the power of a computer uh, with a virtual image. And we look, wow, have we made a lot of progress here. But as you notice, the, the technology side has made a huge amount of, of gain. But over on the other side, I'm not sure. And we'll talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about spiritual technology. And the scripture is John 14, 12. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do even greater things. Greater things. Now, I know we say, wait a minute, what do you mean greater things? Well, greater things. That means greater things than what the Lord himself did. That's what he's saying. We say, well, well wait a minute, uh, the, you know, he did everything. Well, we don't even know what all he did, right? In the book of John, doesn't it say that, that if, if he would have recorded everything, that it would, uh, the world could not even contain all the books? Yet we think the Bible is the, the fully closed uh, canon of God. But there's more. There are greater things. And we're going to be talking about that today. More of the scripture just says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing and greater things. Now, it depends on how you want to look at this thing. Either you are the people that have faith in me, so we should be doing the greater things. Or it could be that if we wanted to define people who have faith in God, if we define it by the Bible, we could say it's very easy. We'll define it operationally. Anybody that's doing what Jesus did and greater things has faith in him by definition. But that's a tough way to go, isn't it? Because that means if you don't do those things, then you don't have faith in Him. So I believe that there's something here. This is a scripture, and I've got to ask you all, do you feel that this scripture is being fulfilled today? He wants to. I agree. I don't think it is fully fulfilled at all. Do you think it will be fulfilled? Yes. yes. All Scripture is going to be fulfilled. The question is, who's going to do it? And how is that going to happen? I believe that this is something that he wrote, and we have a choice. We can either believe our experience, or we can believe what the Word of God says. Now, the experience says, that is not going to happen. But the Word of God says it is. Greater things. What he did and greater things. He continues on, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. This is red letters. This is going to be fulfilled. So I don't believe that we have fully grasped everything that we need to know to fulfill this. But I do believe that the Holy Spirit is going to fulfill it through somebody. How about us? Now this is a prophecy, and uh, if you remember, I... I put uh, sort of a gold background on it to show you that I do not equate a prophecy with the Scripture. However, I do believe it is something by God, and I believe that we should all be receiving prophecy. Whether um, uh, you, you stand up and, li like Ken, gives a word of prophecy, whether uh, for me, I tend to write one down. Many of you uh, journal, and you get words from God. You should be hearing from God. That is the, the way that we should live naturally. So this shouldn't really surprise anyone. So we're going to go through this word and break it down the way I like to break it down is his words often indicate scriptures. And you've got to go to those scriptures to understand what it means. So this world, the word is called what's new, and that's what's inspired this message. He said, what's new? What is new? New is the revealing to you of what I already know. Though it's new to you, it's fact to me. It's established and accomplished. For if I have thought it and I have spoken it, it's truth and exists today. Be not limited by the revealed truth. For I desire to share with you the secrets of my kingdom. Secrets that unlock great revelations and great power. 
B is the Roman centurion who took the opportunity to ascribe to me powers that the world had not seen. But he knew they were there because of his understanding of the world I created. Each day is a new day and can bring new truth, new hope, and new faith, and new power to this world. For I delight in revealing that which is sought after. I have untold treasures waiting to be discovered that can change the very nature of your life. Let the challenges before you be an opportunity to seek a new solution for my kingdom. Now this is sort of a radical thought, and, but we're going to talk through the scriptures to see if this be true. What is new? New is revealing to you what I already know. Though it's new to you, it's fact to me. It's established and accomplished. For I have thought, if I have thought it, if I have spoken it, it's truth and exists today. Well, the scripture I had, it was Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, there's no other. I am God and there's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. <clears throat> Now let me just ask you, does that mean the Lord is able to predict the future? He knows. He knows? Is there more to that? How about the fact that He declares the future? Do you understand? From the beginning, He declares the end. I usually teach most of the gospel out of the first three chapters of Genesis. Because it's right there. Because God declares the end from the beginning. And uh, there's a wedding in the beginning, and there's a wedding in the end. There's a Babylon in the beginning, and there's a Babylon in the end. There are, there are lots of things that God shows and declares from the very beginning. So God knows what's going to happen, not just by predicting it, but He's created these things. So if He's declared it from the beginning, what this Word says is it actually already exists. <clears throat> Whether it's been revealed to us, it still exists. It says, from ancient times, what is still to come, my purpose will stand. He has a purpose and an intent from the beginning, and that will be accomplished throughout history. And I will do all that I please. It says, be not limited to the revealed truth, for I desire to share with you the secrets of my kingdom, secrets that unlock great revelations and great power. I delight in revealing that which is sought after. I have untold treasures waiting to be discovered that can change the very nature of your life. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. However, as it's written, no eye is seen, no ear is heard, no mind is conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. That's where we usually stop, right? <clears throat> That's just a quote out of Isaiah. But there's actually a verse after this. It says what? But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. God desires to reveal these things. He gave us the Holy Spirit for that purpose. The Spirit of truth there to reveal these things. That's what it says right there. God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. God desires that we understand and seek the greater things. Things that may have been hidden even in the Old Testament. Revelation 13, 8, it says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb. The Lamb what? That was slain when? Now, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was slain 2,000 years ago. Do you see what I'm saying? God had determined from the beginning that this would happen. Now, I want you to understand there. Therefore, even though Jesus Christ had not been slain, could uh, the salvation through Christ be made available? He said that the Lamb was slain before the creation of the world. Let me, let me show you something. Let's read Psalm 51. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. Did we, do we have truth in our innermost being? What do we have in our innermost being? The spirit of truth, right? 
You desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part, you will make known, uh, we will know wisdom from our inner parts. It says, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Now, how's that going to happen? Do you see what this is? He is literally talking about salvation, if you will, through Jesus Christ. Continue on. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquity. Cle create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. The Holy Spirit. He said, do not take him from me. So I want you to consider that this is, it's like a new covenant statement, isn't it? Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So here, Christ had not been slain. And yet, from the foundations of the earth, there was a plan, a thought in God's heart. And David found a way to tap into something. It talks about the, the, the prophets that never even saw it, but had faith in it, even though they had not seen and we have seen, and it's still hard for us to believe. But there's things we have not seen out there that God has already spoken, that has already been in the heart of God, that can be made manifest. Yes. Let me continue. In what's new, he says, Be as the Roman centurion, who took the opportunity to ascribe to me powers that the world had not seen. But he knew they were there because of his understanding of the world I created. Let's just take that. The story of the centurions in Matthew 8, 5 through 10. It says, When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help, saying, Lord, he said, My servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus said, I will go and heal him. So Jesus says, Okay, I'm going to go and take care of it. Let's see what the centurion did. We pick it up here. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now before then, Jesus went and healed people. He laid hands on the sick. He did all these things. But the centurion said, no, you don't have to do it. All you have to do is speak the word. He had not done that. It was, it, it's fascinating to, to realize that the centurion, who, by the way, was probably not Jewish, he probably was a Roman centurion, but he had a concept and an understanding, and he was able to apply it to the Lord. He says, For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, this man shouldn't be doing this because I didn't tell him to do it. Is that what he said? What did he say? He said, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Was, so was the Lord upset? No. He was blessed because the man had faith to believe that Jesus all he had to do was the word. That's right. You see, he was able to ascribe to the Lord something that he looked at the creation, he looked at these understanding, he says, wait a minute, I believe that all you really have to do is say the word. And because of that, we now know all he has to do is say the word. So the question is, is it a bad thing when we have a presumption, if you will, by faith of saying, Lord, wait a minute, by what I've seen and what you've created and the things I see about this world, there's something new here. Even though I understand that you've done it this way, I believe that you can do it this way. And what if that's true? What if there are spiritual technologies that exist out there that we have yet to manifest? Now, when Jesus came upon the earth, he did things. Were they magic? No. They, 
That's exactly right. Those were things that the Father had already determined. These were things that already existed in the Spirit. Now, He had the Spirit, but is it a different Spirit than we have? But He took, with the Spirit, He manifested what I'm calling spiritual technologies. And in the Bible, we just see a bunch of them. But like we said, He did much more because the book of John says, oh, the whole world probably couldn't contain all the books of the things He did. So we've just got a little slice of them, and yet we still have not been able to do what He did, even though He gave us a word that says we should. Because those spiritual technologies do exist. They're not magic. He, he did things. This is, you understand the God that we serve is the same God that created this earth and all the realms of technologies within it. So there are things out there that, that we haven't even been able to reach the level that the Lord demonstrated clearly for us. But I think there's even more than that. That's why He said, you will do what I did and even greater. B is the Roman centurion who took the opportunity to describe to me powers that the world had not seen, but he knew they were there because of his understanding of the world I created. Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. And you know what? That includes us. He demonstrated these things being understood from what has been made. So let's just take a little brief moment and talk about that. What has He made? Well, let's just start with some perspective. First of all, you can see this picture here of the sun. That little dot down there, that's the earth, and that's the relative size of the earth to the sun. Now, you understand that we do have something called global warming. We've got this limitations of, of uh, energy, how we're about to run out of energy, etc., on this dot down here. But the sun is actually a million times larger than the Earth. The largest discovered star, which is what the sun is, is estimated to be a billion times larger than our sun. That's pretty big. The Earth is one of 20 billion planets in our galaxy, and there's billions of other galaxies. So this is the God that we serve. And we're looking at it saying, what are we going to do? We're out of energy. <laughs> we're running out of oil and gas. But the sun, which manages to somehow burn evenly every single day for who knows how many thousands of years, sits there and burns at this level. You see, this is the God we serve. We should learn something from this. Does it tell us anything? Does it tell us anything about God? Continuing on, there's now uh, 30 times as many people as there were on the earth when Christ walked the earth. It took over 5,800 years to have one billion people. Happened right back in here around 1830. It took 100 years to get the next billion people. So around 1930, we had 2 billion people. It took 10 years to get the last billion, and that's back here. And you realize now we're up to about 7.2 billion. 1930, there were only 2 billion people, and now there's 7.2 billion. Do you know that if our government, we had the same government back in 1930 that we did now, they of course would be in panic saying, we're going to be out of everything. This world cannot sustain this. But what do we know about our God? 7.2 billion people. Now, what have we run out of? Nothing? You mean we still have oil? We still have gas? We still, the sun comes up in the morning? What does that tell you about our God? Does it tell you how amazing He is? That He's created all of this? So we're looking for our solutions by figuring out 
how to cut down the population or how to do this and how to do that. And I understand we should be good stewards, but shouldn't we seek ye first the kingdom of God? Could it be that God himself may have a plan? The God that created all of this, do you think he's able to handle this? Do you think there's things that we just haven't understood yet? Could it be that maybe there's actually other energy sources? Or maybe we could tap some more from the sun somehow? There may be some things that maybe we shouldn't figure out how to, uh, let's kill off a certain number of people so that we can have enough resources to survive. Maybe we should talk to God first. Oh, by the way, the world oil production, uh, we've run out of oil lots of times. And uh, I remember I was actually around in the earth back in this time when they did it. Back in the 80s, I remember when we ran out of oil. You remember that? But it was successful at raising the prices and convincing the world that we were out of oil. And once the price got raised, they found some more oil. And then they did it again. And once they got the price back up, they found some more oil. But you can imagine now, we're getting probably 85 billion, or excuse me, 85 million barrels, barrels what, 55 gallons, a day of oil out of the earth. You get that? That's a lot of oil. I'm sure that was a lot of these uh, dinosaurs which just happened to have died and decomposed to create this. Isn't that a lot of dinosaurs? Do you see anything here? We have an amazing God. We're just now getting ready to tap into some of the exciting things that are going on. Another part of the perspective, there's an estimated 8.7 million different species on the earth. More being discovered every day. There are none that have been discovered from any other planet. You think the odds, if we go by odds, 8.7 million, you'd think that at least one or two of them would have found their way to another planet, maybe. No. Nope. And by the way, men did not create any of them. Man has not successfully created any of them in all this time. God's pretty smart, isn't he? This is just pictures. What does this say about God? Are these beautiful scenes to you? What does that tell you about God? He creates not only things that are amazing, but they're also beautiful. The most beautiful of all things on the earth just happen to be things God created, aren't they? This is, this is the God we're serving. We, we have not sought Him, but this, He is capable of so much more than we have any idea of. Intelligent design, the reason I bring this up is because the smartest men in the world have decided that this all happened randomly. That there is no creator. But intelligent design says that, you know, the best explanation of everything you're seeing is that there must be an intelligent designer. Okay, I got a cell phone here. What do you think the chances are that this thing just came together <laughs> randomly. I mean, can you look? But do you think this cell phone in complexity even scratches the surface compared to any animal? Man was able to create this, but he's not been able to create an animal. Not one. So it ought to tell us something, that there is a God, and he's capable of handling these things. But we've turned away from him, and that's the problem. Let's start from Genesis 1-3. We're going to go through the Bible. I figure it's a good place to start. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So what do you think happened here? Think this is where God created the sun? No. Why? Because God created the sun on the fourth day, didn't he? Let there be lights in the expanse to separate the day from the night, to give light to the earth. Well, wait a minute, then what did he create on the first day? He created light. The sun is not light. It's a source of light. Do we understand that God created 
light. The whole concept of light was created by God. Do you know what that means? Well, it just so happens the visible spectrum of light is this little bitty narrow band in the electromagnetic spectrum. It's one of those few things that we can see. So we can see light, but it's a very narrow band of something called the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the cell phone works off the electromagnetic spectrum. And you know, we're saying, gosh, it's amazing. Someone thinks that Jesus or even spirits could go through these walls. You see that little bitty band that I'm pointing to? That's about the only thing that doesn't go through those walls. If I've got my cell phone, can I talk to somebody through these walls? Just about everything goes through those walls but light. All these sounds go through the walls. Can, do you see what I'm saying? That we think by what we can see that this wall is solid and it'd be hard for something to go through it. But I have no problem with a cell phone talking to someone on the other side of it. Lots of things go through these things. So we don't even know what other things there is other than light because we know that the electromagnetic spectrum actually travels at 186,000 miles per second. But my guess is there's something even faster in the spiritual realm because I believe that, that spirits are able to travel all the way to the New Jerusalem, wherever it is out there, to headquarters, and come back here pretty quick. Probably much quicker than this, considering those stars out there are millions of light years away. That means, you know what that means? You know what a light year is. That's how, that's how far light travels in one year. And these things are many, many light years away. That's a long way, even at the speed of light. And by the way, electricity, which is light, that the, all these are the same, you understand. The electromagnetic spectrum is everything. God created all of this for us. And the only part that people knew about for hundreds and even thousands of years was this little bitty band about this big called light. We're now figuring out that there's more to it. But spirits must move a whole lot faster. And they're able to move a whole lot more than we understand because they're able to take bodies which can re-manifest here on this earth. You know, beam me up, Scotty. Well, guess what? That works. And we don't know how fast this, the speed of the spirit is. But this is just something he gave us. This was from the beginning, folks. We didn't create this last week. This was from the beginning God created light. Genesis 1-3, it doesn't get much earlier than that and yet is the highest technology that we've been able to achieve. And we're just now figuring it out. Advancements in electricity. Electricity is defined and given a name in 1600. 1729, there was a discovery that some materials could conduct electricity and some didn't. 1729. 1808, the first arc lamp was built. That arc lamp is about like a little piece of lightning. 1821, the first electric motor. 1844, the electric telegraph is invented. 1879, the first incandescent bulb. 1908, the first elect electric appliance. 1947, the first electronic semiconductor transistor. All electronics is based upon the electronic semiconductor transistor. And it was only discovered in 1947 is that the first computer was actually built about the same time that Israel became a nation, just to let you know. All this happened at the same time. But let me ask you, do you know anything about transistors? What are they made of? Silicon. Silicon. Now, how rare is silicon on the earth? <laughs> That's right, it's sand. There's probably very few things that are even more common than silicon. And yet silicon has this unbelievable property that when you put it together in a certain way, it can control the flow of electricity. Someone discovered this. Now, when do you think the properties of silicon actually went into silicon? From the beginning. Do you understand that there's, 
this technology is all based upon a piece of sand that God created when He created the earth. So all of this technology that we got that we're thinking is new, God created a long time ago. This stuff just didn't show up on the earth through some meteorite or something. This was already here. That's the God we serve. Cell phone invented by Motorola in 1973. But the first uh, commercial wireless call was done in 1983. That's all. This is a two and a half pound cellular phone here. This is sort of where we are now. We might be going back that direction, actually. Uh, but all you could do with a cell phone then was talk. <laughs> How about now? You can move data, you can move all sorts of things. Pictures, you can move lots of things across your cell network. Um, do you have the network? This is a little guy over here. You remember the Verizon guy? Do you have the network? It's fascinating. We're sitting here figuring out that this cell phone is really not what it's all about. What it's about is the network. This little cell phone cannot talk to Africa. This cell phone can only talk to a tower that's within two miles from here. That tower is connected through all sorts of network over to Africa. They have, because sound is so slow, they've got to change it into light so that it's fast enough to get across to Africa and you can hold a conversation. This morning we had our Thursday morning meeting and uh, uh, Susan dialed in from St. Albans, UK and was right online with us and did the conversation with us as if she was right there. It's a long way. That's the technology that we have. But how can that be? Because sound doesn't travel that fast. And yet we're having trouble figuring out what, how the spiritual realm works. What I mean by that is, you pray, don't you? How's that work? What, is magic? What? What if I told you that God has a network also? And he's had it for a long time. And somehow he's able to not only see but record everything that goes on down here. Jonah was able to pray to God, right? Where was he? In a belly of a whale at the bottom of the ocean. Who was it? Where can I go from you, Lord? So whatever it is, whatever this network is that God has, it works 24 hours a day. It never goes down. And you can hear it from everywhere. And if it wasn't for the cell phone, you guys may, we may not even be able to understand that it's technology. It's spiritual technology. It looks like that over on the right-hand side. That's the network you want. Now, the, the Verizon network has come a long way. They carry not only voice. They now can carry uh, text. They can carry pictures. They can carry Internet. It carries a whole lot more than it used to carry. But the network on the right carries not only that, but it actually carries spiritual and physical bodies, which apparently can move from the New Jerusalem to here very quickly. It can carry power. It actually transmits power through that network. Healing power can be manifest through it. It's amazing, the, the network of God. That's what I call spiritual technology. This is not magic. This is the same God who designed all of this stuff. And we're slowly figuring out with our brilliant minds the technology that we have on the earth thinking we've really got it made. But I'm telling you there's a spiritual technology that's even greater. And we have yet to even match what Jesus did when he said, you will do what I do and greater. How come? How come the world has been able to move the technology forward in such a great way, and yet we seem to have had a lot of trouble moving spiritual technology forward? What's different? What's the problem here? I believe there is a problem. I believe that we're not understanding the kingdom that he taught us. I believe that, that our minds just don't seem to want to understand what he's trying to show us. I believe that the Holy Spirit will do it, though. Don't you? Yes. Because don't the red letters say this is going to happen? Yes. It will happen. Amen. But you've got to be open. 
like the centurion. Just because the world hadn't necessarily seen this, the centurion didn't have any problem. Martha and Mary should have figured that out, right? You remember with Lazarus? Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. So what would Jesus have had to done to raise Lazarus from the dead? You mean he didn't have to actually go there? See, there's so much that we don't grasp yet. But I think he wants us to. He complimented the centurion. Oh, by the way, if we look at the great revelations that we've had and compare them to time, this is it right here. Electricity was finally discovered here. The transistor was invented here. The cell phone was invented here. All of this time, none of those existed. All of this has really come pretty much since 1947, since the transistor. And I'm, that's about how old, you know, I mean, I was born in 49. Ken was born in 47, so he's about the same age as, the, as our technology. Is that amazing? And yet, spiritually, we should be doing the same thing, guys. The Lord said, in the latter day, knowledge shall increase. Mm-hmm, and it, that knowledge increased, but we need to get the other knowledge to increase. Help us, Lord. Exactly. But are we ready? I mean, there's a lot of work that goes on in spiritual technology. You know how many... How many times Edison failed with the light bulb before he got it right? 10,000. Actually, he knows. <laughs> That's frightening. Yeah. So have you been willing to try something 10,000 times to get it right? We try one thing and I prayed for them and they weren't healed, so I guess it doesn't work. Yeah, there's, there's some real dedication for you. <laughs> So if we look at Revelation, and we look at, uh, in the Revelation, you know, they were looking back. This is, you know, what, 1,900 years ago? Let me read something for you. Revelation 4, 6. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in the front and back. Now, this sounds like a monster scene, doesn't it? But what is it? If you, had to, if you know by today's technology, what do you think this is? Does it look an awful lot like a TV screen? And don't these living beings look like moving cameras to you with eyes all around them? Wouldn't that be the way you would describe it? Could it be God's got a, a large, I mean, we're talking about a large big screen in front of him? Wouldn't it look like a, a crystal sea? And wouldn't these creatures that have uh, eyes all over them, doesn't that look like cameras? So maybe God is able to watch everything that's going on down here? So this is the Truman Show. That's right. It may be the, this may be the Steve Show. Never you may be on up there right now. Everybody's uh, watching the Steve, the Steve McKenzie Show. You know, it's, this is a reality down here. There's a lot of people up there watching the reality show down here. But wouldn't you say that certainly could describe a large TV screen? If we look further on in Revelations, and I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Standing beside the sea were those who had victor vic were been victorious over the beast. So what was happening here? These are the people that basically didn't take the mark, and what are they watching? They're standing around the screen, what are they watching? A sea of glass mixed with fire. What do you think that looks like? That looks like a pretty bad scene down here on the earth, wouldn't you say? But how would you describe it if you didn't understand the technology? I mean, it's a strange thing to think about, but I'm just saying here that the God that created all of this exciting technology that we have is the same God who created all the spiritual technology that maybe He wants to reveal to us by the things that have been made, as He said He did. Just a thought. Are we really ready to, wait a minute, God, if I can do this with my cell phone, can't I? 
you know, if I can get a text from this stuff, then, or if, if things can come through here, then they can come through me. Because don't I have the, the Holy Spirit? Isn't that a major connector to your power? Isn't that a power source? How do I get that out of here? How do I, you know, how does that, the, the two fingers work thing, you know? First Corinthians, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for what? Our glory, he says, the glory of the church. Before when? Before time began. You see what I'm saying? He planned it this way. None of the rulers of this age understood it. They don't today either. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, which they're trying to do today. However it's written, no eye has seen nor ear has heard. That's how that starts. Even greater. Notice, by the way, you're saying, well, that's not talking about miracles. Oh, yeah? Believe me when I say that I am the, in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe me on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing, which is what? Yeah. Pretty clear. So what's new? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let me read to it just one time. What is new? New is the revealing to you what I already know. Though it's new to you, it's fact to me. It is established and accomplished. For if I have thought of it and I have spoken it, it's true and exists today. That's it, whether or not you've seen it. Be not limited by the revealed truth, for I desire to share with you the secrets of my kingdom. Secrets that unlock great revelation and great power. Be as the Roman centurion who took the opportunity to describe to me powers that the world had not seen. But he knew they were there because of the understanding of the world I created. Each day is new, and each day can bring new truth, new hope, new faith, and new power to this world. For I delight in revealing that which is sought after. I have untold treasures waiting to be discovered that can change the very nature of your life. Let the challenges before you be an opportunity to seek a new solution from my kingdom. Do you know those challenges before us have seemed to be the situation that's driven the technologies of this world? They should be driving our spiritual technologies. 